Napoleon like anyone can even know that. Hi friends, welcome! So today we'll continue our journey of learning about Windows privilege escalation by way of potato attacks. What? Potatoes? Brussels? Well, so glad you asked, Schmiegel. So potato attacks are a whole class of attacks that at their heart focus on abusing impersonation privilege tokens. In a certain manner of speaking, you can almost think of them as the Windows version of when we abuse pseudo privileges in Linux. Basically meaning that we're allowed to execute commands as another user which can ultimately lead to system or administrator privileges. Now there are, are a whole variety of potato attacks, the simplest being the potato attack, but we get things like juicy potato and rotten potato. And the differences can be quite technical, so instead of boring you here now, I'm gonna drop a link right in the top of the description to an excellent overview from Hacktrix. Today specifically we'll be focusing on a juicy potato attack by attacking the Hack the Box machine called Jeeves. In today's video we'll be making our lives a little bit easier by relying on Metasploit and then in the next video we'll perform the same basic attack without Metasploit. But in any case, methinks that's enough with all this flip and dilly dally and so let's get to it. Yeah. All right, friends, and so we find ourselves here in the terminal on Kali Linux. I've already spun up the actual Jeeves machine on the Hack the Box website, but I always like to just go ahead and ping it before I start, just to make sure we are actually connected. You know, otherwise, you can run in map and wonder why you're not getting the results you should be getting, etc. But obviously, you can see there we are GTG. And as these things go, we'll start off with an nmap scan. Definitely no big surprise there. So I'm just going to quickly run you through the philosophy or my train of thought behind the nmap scan that I like to do. Uh, so we're just going to start with SC and SV. And this is of course kind of now known colloquially as the IPSEC scan. Toasty! Popularized of course by the legendary IPSEC, SC will run a variety of built-in nmap scripts to try and extract more information for us. And then SV will help to enumerate versions of different services running on the ports that are open. Now of late, I've also added the dash A, which as I described before, can also f help to further enumerate. And then of course, when we just run a default nmap scan, if I were to run it as it is now, it will only scan the top 1000 ports. Um, but if you do dash p dash, uh, it's now going to scan all 65,535 ports. Now, why don't we just always do this? Why don't we just always scan all the ports? Well, for a number of potential reasons, right? It will take quite a long time and it's obviously quite an aggressive and noisy scan. Now, given that, why do I do it then? Well, the reason I'm doing it is because this is a hack the box CTF. This is a retired machine, right? I'm not taking part in a competition, I'm not trying to get a first blood on a new release, and this isn't an actual pen test, so I don't care about getting caught. And so what I'm trying to get at here, friends, is simply that, you know, the kind of scam that you do is obviously contextual, right? Depending on different scenarios, you might have to kind of like dial back the aggressiveness and, you know, favor stealthiness. Uh, but in this context, since I have time and since I can use the magic of editing to make time fast forward and show you the results in the end, this is a nice scan to do. And if you're just practicing by yourself at home, this is a good one that will kind of ensure you get the most information possible. Uh, and then one thing I like to add is T4, uh, like I showed before, that's just going to speed our scan up a tiny little bit. And again, it's a little bit more aggressive, but we don't really care in this context. And then we can provide the IP, which is 10, 10, 10, 63 for Jeeves, and let's go. And so here we can see our results. We can see on both port 80 and port 50,000, we have HTTP servers. And now they're different. We have an IIS, which is, of course, the popular Microsoft web server on 80. Uh, and then additionally, on 50,000, we have something called Jetty. Now, Jetty is just a Java-based web server. It's kind of a container that provides, how can we say, a, a platform for web applications. And it's popular-ish, or I think it used to be more popular, because uh, it's, it's kind of like very lightweight um, and has a small footprint. 
Uh, but in any case, I just actually wanted to mention as well that, you know, if had we not run the dash p dash, uh, 50,000 wouldn't fall under our top 1000 ports. And so if we didn't run dash p dash, if we just, uh, you know, use the default in map scan without specifying extra ports, uh, we would have missed that. Anyway, back to our results. Uh, we can also see on 135 we have uh, RPC. And then on 445 we have SMB. So for SMB, you know, we could definitely see if we could perhaps connect to it anonymously. We could try and enumerate and see if it has vulnerable versions. But for now, as I've said many times before, if there are web servers, the first thing I always like to do is just pop open my browser and head over and see what's going on. And if there's potentially a website or something we can access via browser. So let's do that. All right, so here in our browser, let's head over to 10.10.10.63. And of course, if we don't specify the port, the browser is going to default to port 80. And we can see there's an Ask Jeeves page. And for those of you young uns, uh, I don't know if people still use Ask Jeeves, but it kind of used to be a search engine mildly popular in the 2000s. Uh, so let's see what happens here. Uh, let's search for the 9090s, guys. Oh, and we get an error. Um, and I don't know if you notice, if I click and drag, you see what happens. Uh, so that kind of indicates to me this isn't actually even a real page. Uh, this is just an image. The thing that even threw me off, first of all, is I can see the resolution. Uh, this kind of looks a little bit skewed, right? The text seems kind of flattened out and stretched a little horizontally, uh, which looked weird. And of course, we can right click and inspect. And we can see right there, it's jeeves.png. So this isn't even a real response. And we can see a few other links here. But notice in the bottom left hand corner, if I hover over any one of them, uh, we get 10, 10, 10, 63 hash. Uh, that just means basically it's a broken link. And so this whole thing is kind of like, how can we think, as a cardboard cutout? Uh, it's an illusion. It's, a, it's actually an optical illusion. It's the pattern on the pants. The, it's not fl flattering in the the crotchal region. It just kind of wants to give us the impression that there's a search engine here, but really there's nothing. And now, of course, for those of you that didn't know, we still want to visit the same IP address, right? But we want to go to our unusual port, which is 50,000. And to do that, we simply add 50,000. And we can see here's another error right here. And if we click on this, it takes us to a different link of eclipse.dev jetty. And as I said before, jetty is just the kind of like Java web server being used on this port. So that's not of any interest to us right now. And now, of course, we can, you know, go ahead and see if we can access anything like robots, robust. But there's nothing here. And so instead of like goofing around like this, why don't we just go ahead and run a GoBuster query on both of these ports? Uh, so I'm going to head back to my terminal uh, and so we'll run go buster dir and u to specify the URL. Uh, so in this case, of course, we're 10, 10, 10, 63 and we'll specify the word list. And this time I'm actually not going to opt for our friend Daniel Measler's uh, word list, uh, but we're actually going to kind of co-opt a word list from dir buster. And so Durbuster is another app like GoBuster. It does directory enumeration and it's uh, kind of the GUI option that's popular in Kali. But of course, there's no reason why we couldn't go ahead and use the exact same word list that it comes with, right? So we'll do lowercase and we'll do medium. So let's go ahead and run that. And while that's uh, busy doing its thing, I'm just going to go ahead and copy this. Create an open a new tab with Control Shift T. I'll hit Control Shift V to paste. I'll hit Home to go to the front. And I'll just scroll ahead a little bit and I'll just change that exactly like we had to do in the browser, guys. Uh, we just add 50,000 50, right there. And let's run that at the same time. And through the magic of editing, I'll see you at the end. Okay, friends, so as you can see, we're not quite done yet, but we've got a hit on our 50,000 ports. Now, if I hit control tab, it'll kind of toggle between our other tab. Uh, we can see here we haven't found anything on our regular port 80. Uh, but obviously, there's no reason why we couldn't go ahead right now and go look at this page while GoBuster continues doing its magic in the background. So let's head over to our browser and check out this Ask Jeeves page. 
So we'll just add ask Jeeves. So just briefly, in case you don't know what Jenkins is, it's an open source uh, automation server that one can use to automate different aspects of, uh, you know, whether it's building, testing, or deploying software. It's not really my area of expertise, but it's something that's kind of used in CI, CD, you know, continuous integration, continuous delivery pipelines. In any case, the first thing that kind of pops out to me right here is on the bottom right, we can see there a version number, version 2.87. And now that's obviously something we can go ahead and try to see if it's vulnerable to specific any known exploit. And then we could potentially go down that rabbit hole a little bit further. But even before we focus on that, there are kind of two common misconfigurations with Jenkins that are very dangerous because they could potentially allow us to remotely execute commands. Uh, the first one is by creating a new project. Uh, that's not the one I'm going to do right now because it's a really sloppy and messy process uh, and it's also blind. So it's kind of really difficult to know whether or not it'll work. But ultimately, that is obviously an option that's there for us too. And so the second one is if we are allowed under Manage Jenkins uh, to access not Jenkins CLI, which obviously sounds kind of exciting as well, but actually Script Console. Uh, and we can read right there, executes arbitrary scripts for admin troubleshooting diagnostics. So, you know, as a pen tester or a red teamer or a hacker, that should immediately excite you. Anytime you see the word execute, it should kind of like, you know, peak your feelers. So let's go over there. And now we get really excited because we can actually see that this allows us to type in an arbitrary groovy script and execute it on the server. Groovy, baby. And in case you didn't know, Groovy is, it's basically a type of language. You can think of it as kind of a higher level of abstraction built on top of Java to just make Java easier and simpler to work with. And perhaps an analogy that can help you kind of understand it better is obviously TypeScript is something very popular these days. So as TypeScript is to JavaScript, so Groovy is to Java. And so in any case, it seems like right here, we would be able to allow to input groovy syntax and then click run and that'll then execute directly on our Jenkins server. And so obviously, I don't think I even need to mention this, but whenever we see anything like this, any ability to execute commands on the server, on the target system, the first thing that comes to our head is reverse TCP connection. Now, there are potentially many ways to do this. We saw, for example, earlier as well that this is an IIS system. So there's probably a good probability that we'll be able to run PowerShell commands on this. Um, but it also happens to be the case that there is a specific Groovy reverse TCP script. And so I think that's a great place to start. That seems kind of like as our most sure bet at this point. And so let's just go ahead and open a new tab. And I'm just going to write Groovy reverse TCP script. And we see this first hit right there on GitHub called Pure Groovy Java Reverse Shell. And right in there, I'm just going to click on Raw. And here we can basically see some Groovy script, which creates a reverse TCP connection. So I'm just going to hit Control A, Control C. Let's head back to Jenkins with Control Tab. And I'm just going to hit Control V to paste that. And of course, the only thing we really need to change here is the string host. Right now it says localhost, but let's change that to our IP. So I'll head back to terminal. And here in terminal, just for interest sake, we can see there's nothing else on port 50,000 that uh, GoBuster could find. Let's quickly look at port 80. And there's nothing there. Great. So we have a kind of clear indicator that we're probably on the right path. I'm just going to clear. I'll run IPA. Uh, and we can see that we're 10, 10, 14, 11. Let's head back to the browser. And I'll change that, of course, to 10, 10, 14, 11. Now, we could change the port if we wanted to, but we don't need to because, of course, we could simply create a Netcat listener on 8044. So I'll hit Alt-Tab. We're back in Terminal. And I'll just create a Netcat listener LVNP on 8044. And so I'll tab back in our browser and now we should simply be able to run this and get our reverse TCP connection. So let's try that out. And in case you didn't know, typically when we launch a reverse TCP connection from a browser and it kind of hangs, it just stalls like this. It's usually a good sign. So back in our terminal, 
uh, we can see that indeed we were able to get a reverse TCP connection and we find ourselves in C users administrator Jenkins. Uh, so let's just quickly do a little bit of enumeration. So let's run who am I? And we can see that we are the username Kosuke. Kosuke obviously sounds pretty Japanese and I didn't know what it meant or who it was. Uh, so I had to look it up. And it so happens that Kosuke Kawaguchi, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, is the Japanese creator of Jenkins. And so I guess it's a little bit of a shout out there to the godfather of Jenkins. Arigato Kosuke Kawaguchi. And so the first thing is obviously friends is that you can now go to C users Kosuke desktop and you'll find the first flag there. I'm not gonna show it because I don't want to spoil the fun. Uh, but if you got here, feel free to go fetch the flag. And now whenever we get on the box as a lower privilege user, kind of the first thing we always do is the variety of different enumeration, right? We can upload WinPs, we can upload PowerUp, uh, we could run sysinfo and copy that back to our system and run Windows Privilege Escalation Checker. Many different things we could do. But I don't want to kind of dwell and get lost in this too much. But since we know that today our intention is to perform a rotten potato attack, which itself is of course underpinned by having the impersonate privilege enabled, let's run who am I forward slash priv and see. And we can see right there that we have SE impersonate privilege enabled. So this gives us immediately a very clear indication that we're on the right track and that we might be able to perform a potato or rotten potato or juicy potato attack. So now at this point, we're basically going to branch off into path A, which is our Metasploit path. And then in the next video, we'll branch to the alternate path, which is going to be path B. But for now, like I said, today we're gonna use Metasploit. Uh, so I'm gonna use the fact that we have a shell here already. I'm gonna go into Metasploit and I'm basically going to convert this command prompt shell for us into a meterpreter shell. So I'm gonna hit Control Shift T, which creates a new tab and I'll run MSF console. Now here in MSF console, we're gonna use exploit multi script forward slash web delivery. And so just briefly before we kind of start engaging with it, what we're gonna do here is this is just gonna help us to generate some PowerShell script, which we can then go and copy back into our command prompt shell that we already established this is gonna call back to MSF console and this will give us a meterpreter shell here. And so, as I've said before, meterpreter opens up a whole new world of possibilities with all the various kind of plugins, whether that's enumeration or exploits, which we don't have in a regular command prompt shell. Uh, so first thing, let's just look at our options here. Uh, we can see server host and L host. In this case, both of these will be our IP. So I'll set SRV host to 10, 10, 14, 11. And I'll also set L host to 10, 10, 14, 11. We can leave the L port as is. Uh, we can leave the payload as is now as well. Um, but the final thing is we see here exploit target Python. Now Python might or might not be installed on the target system. But let's just quickly look at all our options. Um, and if we look at our options, what we see here too is PowerShell. And now again, since this is a Windows system, we know it's also being used to host a IIS web server. The probability of it running PowerShell is far greater than the probability of it running Python. So let's simply say set target to, uh, which now we'll have changed that to PowerShell. I'm just gonna quickly show our options again. And we can see our IP is good, our IP is good, and we're now gonna do PowerShell. So if I hit run, wah, 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 because actually we don't have the right payload. I forgot to change that. Um, we can see Python. We basically just want to change this Python for Windows, right? So I'll say set payload Windows meterpreter for slash reverse TCP. Let's change that. Let's look at our options again real quick. And we should now be good. Let's hit run again. And we can see it basically just created a heavily obfuscated PowerShell command. So let's just go ahead and copy that. Control tab, we're back here. Control shift V to paste it and it ran. So let's head back to MSF console. And we can see there meterpreter session one opened. 
So we can just write sessions I for interact and then one. And now we have our new interpreter session. Let's just run get UID and we can see indeed we're on Jeeves Gosuki just as we saw in Iran who am I in the command prompt show. And, and just as we did there, we can use the interpreter function called get privs, and it'll again show us that we do have SE impersonate privileges. Right, so let's make use of our awesome enumeration built in module in interpreter, and we'll run post multi recon, Ooh, sorry, local exploit suggester. And now obviously we have an idea that we could run potato attacks because we do have impersonate privileges, but we don't know which exact exploit this might be vulnerable to. So that's why we run this just to kind of like zoom in another level and get a little bit more detail. All right, it's done. So let's scroll up and we can see here everything here in green. So one to 10 are things that we can see it appears to be vulnerable to. And what we're interested in today is eight and nine and reflection is a potato attack. And so juicy reflection is our juicy potato attack. My apologies. I just realized earlier I mentioned rotten potato. We're not doing rotten potato. We're doing juicy potato. Um, okay, so we could probably mess around with that at the same time. Uh, but when I practiced this, I just had more success uh, with juicy potato. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. So I'm just going to go and I'm just going to copy the name and then we'll go back and we'll hit background and we can see obviously that our session is one. And so now all we're going to do is we'll write use. I'm just going to paste the thing I just copied uh, and we can see basically we've, you know, configured now to use this exploit. Let's run show options. The first thing we'll need is our session. So let's set session to one. And then next, let's set our L host, which is of course us to 10, 10, 14, 11. And then the L port is fine. We can leave it as is so we can run. And we can see right there's interpreter session two opened friends. So now fingers crossed, let's write sessions I two, and we have our new interpreter shell and let's run get UID. And we can see that we have system. Nice. And that's it. You can now obviously write shell. You could see the into C users, administrator, desktop, if we're under, we can see our flag right there. And now, of course, the last thing we need to do is just cat it out or in command prompt type. But wap wap wah, the flag is elsewhere. Look deeper, look within. And so what does this mean, friends? Look deeper. Well, this is basically Ipsec's little Easter egg to help remind us of alternate data streams. Now, what are alternate data streams? Well, it's just a way to kind of package additional information to a file, which the user typically won't see, but which can communicate some information to the system. So a great example of this is Mark of the Web. Many times when you download something and you then try to run it, your operating system immediately warns you and tries to kind of like encourage you not to open it because it says it can be unsafe. Now, how does the operating system know you downloaded this from the internet? Well, because it contains something called the mark of the web. And the mark of the web is just some data that we as the user don't see, but which the operating system can see and which is telling it that this file was downloaded from the internet. So we typically cannot see the alternate data streams. However, if instead of running dir, we ran dir for slash r, now we can see it. We can see right there, we have hn.txt, root.txt data. And so there's a few ways we could potentially view this, but one very easy way right here in the command prompt is simply to write more and then redirect it to that. And then we can see our flag right there. Congrats, friends, you did it. Yeah. Alright friends, I hope you enjoyed that walkthrough. Please join me again shortly in which I'll do another video on attacking this same machine, but where instead of using Metaspot, we'll be following a more manual approach. You won't want to miss out because it will obviously be awesome. So until then, 
Peace out. Thank you.